I want to look at the subject of the gospel and prayer. The gospel and prayer. Here at Peace Presbyterian Church, we have given out two tracts. Tracts are little writings, tractates, <laughs> and people read uh, what is inside them. And they can read that and respond likewise. This tract is called Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if we give this to someone and they read it, they will read this. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he really the Son of the living God? And the Bible says he is God's only Son. He is the only one through whom all mankind can be saved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. John 14.6 says, I am the only way, truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only one that we can go to God through if we want to have eternal life. Sin has entered the world and we are under its power. No one can be set free from sin on their own account. Romans 3, 23 and 24a says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. If we have a right relationship with God's Son, Jesus, today, we are accepted to God, acceptable to God, who saves us by His grace. His righteousness covers our unrighteous acts. Salvation is God's gift to all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can we receive eternal life in Christ Jesus just by believing in what we think is right? No one can come to God but through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. Salvation is a gift from God. You can't earn it, work for it, or ever be good enough to receive it. It only comes through believing by faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If we ask God, he will forgive us all our sin, no matter what we have done. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And on the back it has the response to this gospel. It says, how to receive peace and forgiveness with God. One, you admit, you personally admit to God that you want to be free from sin's death penalty. Confess your sins to God, asking him to forgive you for living without him. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and receive by faith. Ask Jesus to come into your heart to give you God's free gift of salvation. The evidence of new life in Christ will be peace in your heart, which will follow your confession of faith. You are now alive spiritually. We are now guaranteed eternal life in heaven when we die. Ephesians 1, 13b to 14a says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And it has the, the sinner's prayer. Lord, I admit that I need you and I confess my sin. Forgive me for living without you. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Cleanse me now. I ask you to come into my heart and life. Be my saviour from this day forward until you call me home. 
Amen. In these tracks, they're very short. There's a lot of things missing. They are making some fundamental points. We use that word fundamental or core value points for people. This is another track. Why should you take Jesus seriously? It says there aren't there thousands of great thinkers we should take seriously. Why should we take Jesus more seriously than any of them? How could we know if any religious teacher had it right unless God came down in person and told us? Jesus is. That's what it says. Jesus is dot dot dot. First, the only one who claimed to be God who came down to us. Jesus claimed to be the eternal Son of God, the creator God of the universe, one with the Father who came into this world in all of history. Jesus is the only founder or leader of any world religion who claimed to be God. That doesn't prove he was God, but it sure narrows the field down. As C.S. Lewis says, the only alternative for a mere human teacher making such a claim would be that of a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg or an evil liar. You can say Jesus was lying or deluded if you want, but you better take him seriously because if you get it wrong, you just might be arguing with God. The only one who offered a way. The great world religions agree with the problem. They all say we have done wrong things and we are answerable. They all have the concept of hell as a place of justice for our wrongdoing, including those that believe in karma and reincarnation. In other words, they all agree if you do the crime, you do the time. And all the religions try offering ways to stop making the problem worse, i.e. I. if you follow their rules, pray enough, do this or don't do that, then they say the penalty will not be as great. But what if you have already done wrong, told a lie or been angry, or will in the future? It's too late to stop making the problem worse. What about a solution? What about a way to remove the penalty? Well, Jesus' death on the cross is the only way offered to pay the full penalty of all the wrongdoings for all who would repent and believe in him. He provided a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 14 verse 6. He's the only one who divides history. Much of the world dates its calendar from the time when Jesus came into the world. Jesus' influence on history has been greater than that of any other person in history. One of the three, one in three people claim to be Christian, 33%. That is almost as many as all the other four major world religions put together, 39%. Those who have taken Jesus' teaching seriously have given us concepts such as free education, hospitals as we know them, aid organizations, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, orphanages, churches were the first orphanages, great reforms and human rights in prisons, reforms in factory work and mines, the Salvation Army's care for the needy and the protection of animals, the RSPCA, were founded by an English clergyman based on the Bible's teaching that a righteous man cares for his animals, Proverbs 12.10. The record of Jesus' life and teaching is documented with more manuscript evidence, both in its antiquity and number, than any other person or event in the history of the world prior to the invention of printing. Jesus is the only one who fulfills prophecy. Jesus didn't simply make a claim about himself. He fulfills hundreds of prophecies of the promised Messiah to come that were written down centuries before he was born. Some are so detailed where he would be born in Bethlehem, his death and resurrection, that it is mathematically impossible to be fulfilled by chance. Jesus is the only one who defeated death. Jesus died in the place of all who believe in him, and he rose from the dead, that we might live again, even after we die. Unlike all other great leaders and thinkers, Jesus' tomb is empty. 
Jesus is the only one who gave us the concept of heaven. Where do Westerners get the idea of heaven as a personal ongoing existence? Our dearly departed are smiling down on us, etc. In Eastern religions, there is no personal ongoing identity in the afterlife. Nirvana means extinction. Religions that come after Jesus have openly drawn on the concept from the Bible and Jesus for their doctrine of heaven. Jesus said he is the maker of heaven. Wouldn't it be a good idea to check with the owner of the place before you presume you have a room booked? Jesus is the only one the others take seriously. Even when the great world religions try to reduce Jesus down to a prophet, a guru or a god, they still point to him as someone to be taken seriously. Jesus never pointed to them but pointed to himself, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no uh, challenge for response. This from the Presbyterian Church, which we focus on the point that, that God, by his Spirit, gives us rebirth. And so we are not trying to flatter people or manipulate them or use hypnosis or something, or use some kind of sleight of hand. We are giving people the truth for God to apply this gospel to them. And this is my final point. The first point is people have to be told. And at the time of Christmas or any time, really, are we telling them? Well, we set aside special people for evangelism. And we don't have many evangelists in, in the churches today, so we don't have an evangelist set aside in our church, not even in our presbytery, not even in our whole state. Um, no, the employment of evangelists is, is not as prominent as it should be for us. We should have evangelists who are out there on a Saturday morning talking to people, uh, sharing these tracts and, and doing things like that. We should be identifying and doing that. But what we do is we make pastors and and in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul says to Timothy, Do the work of an evangelist. You, the pastor, preaching the word, open up your place to a public worship, invite people to come along and hear the gospel as you preach it, and do the work of an evangelist. Be thinking about the conversion of people around. Then everybody also is a light. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. And you don't put your light under your bed. You, you put it up on a lampstand so it can shine and all can see your life. And says, make the most of every opportunity and, and give a defense for, for the hope that you have in you in Jesus Christ. So, so every believer is a, is a witness to Jesus Christ and will do some form of evangelism or another. There's another point, but it's the work of God. God builds his church. Jesus through the Spirit, is building his church. And what is impossible for hardened hearts to sin, to be softened and believe in Jesus, is possible because God is at work. God's Spirit is at work. And that brings us to this point of prayer. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, we see the connection between the evangelists going out, or the apostles, the missionaries, uh, the pastoral team, the ministry team, the gospel workers. And it says there in, in 2 Corinthians 1, from verse 8, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Just think of that. There is a person there who's suffering, 
it's Paul and, and he mentions Timothy and Sosthenes. As, that there's quite a few, Apollos, Silas, there's a whole team of evangelists, of missionaries. Now they're going into areas where there's no, no Christians, no believers in Jesus, and they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching Christ and Christ crucified. And out of this, people are believing and coming together as a church. What is the cost of the evangelist? It says there, the affliction we experienced, burden beyond our strength, despaired of life, we've received the sentence of death. It's very, very, very hard work. And because you're going into an environment where people have their idols and they're attached to their idols, and by presenting the gospel, you're saying, let go of that idol, change who you are, what you believe, and become a new person in Jesus Christ. And people don't want that. People say, I am who I am, and you've got to accept me as I am. Be what you want to be. Do what you want to do. I am mine. I did it my way. And so, of course, to bring a gospel to that situation is going to bring conflict. Now, in those days, the conflict got very physical and hard and even involved the government throwing in prison. We have a religious tolerance in Australia that means there's more just a passive aggression or a, a sense of brooding about don't say that or, or just sl sly comments or gaslighting or all these things they call it. But, but it, it's not to this extent. But still, there is a resistance. There is a difficulty in doing it. What then is required of the church community? It says there, you also must help us by prayer. So we have people set apart who are doing the work of evangelists, who are talking to non-Christians, who, who are inviting them to put all their, their heart's trust in Jesus Christ, who alone is the Saviour. And they're getting pushback. They're getting, uh, they're, they're getting persecuted in one degree or another, uh, for such a work. Well, what is necessary from the church? It says there in verse 11, 2 Corinthians 1, 11, you also must help us by coming out and delivering tracts. He doesn't say that. By giving us more money so, so that we can buy more things to do the work for us? No, he doesn't say that. Paul's putting his heart into this. He says, you also must help us by prayer. Not by petitioning the government to say, oh, we want religious tolerance and we, we just want uh, life to be easy. Uh, not by having a committee meeting or forming a subcommittee that's going to look into it. You also must help us by prayer. God has set up the administration of this new covenant in Jesus Christ that every believer must be committed to pray for this work of the gospel. So that, and that, that that's, there's causative, so that this is going to respond. You must pray so that Many will give thanks. We want a, a thanksgiving. We, we give thanks for life. God has given us life today, life eternal in Jesus Christ. But many will give thanks. This gospel will continue to save people. Because the blessings of you praying for that worker and God upholding that worker and that worker going forth and being able to overcome and have the strength to keep going is going to keep the church going. It's going to plant new churches. It's going to strengthen people's faith that they persevere to the end. So that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. The blessings granted, the work of the kingdom is not one person who we pay for and say, go out and do the work. 
See, it's it's not like home renovation. You get the plumber, and the plumber you know fixes the the pipes, the water. You turn on the tap, the water comes. You say, oh, I give thanks for the plumber for that. And and, and the builder, you know, puts a roof on, so when it rains, you're not wet. You say, I give thanks, the builder has done that. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to participate in except to pay money and let them do their work. And it is very sad the church today sees pastors just as professionals. And we talk a lot about, you know, where what is the contract to the pastor and what should the pastor do and how many hours and the, as if this is just a professional job. But this is a vocation and we give pastors a stipend. We give gospel workers a stipend so that they are set free to do the work. We don't pay them by hour. We, we pay, we set them apart so their life is free to do this work. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, Paul only starts mentioning finances and the, the, the need for help from chapter 8 and, and chapter 9. But right here in the beginning, in verse 11, he says, You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. So we got to get up in the morning and pray. I was at a mission committee and I was very encouraged by the news of how some people there have, have a calendar. They have a little directory of the missionaries and every morning in their breakfast, they have the missionary prayer that directory there. And they open it up and they pray for missionaries. How are we doing that? What missionaries do you know? What missionaries are you praying for? What gospel workers are you praying for? What chaplains are you praying for? What pastors are you praying for? Certainly to go to a church to pray for your pastor is a beginning. But then there are, there are other workers around also. Paul doesn't say pray for me. He says you must help us. And to be thinking about that work and what's going on. Now, if this was the only text, you'd say, oh, well, this is just an incidental thing that, 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 that's just been thrown in there. But Jesus himself explained prayer. He didn't explain other things. We have a lot of conflict over, <laughs> over end times, what's going to happen at the end times here or there, or how do we have the Lord's Supper? Do we do this? Do we do that? You know, what, what is the mode of baptism that is best? And all that? So we have, we have these things, but because Jesus didn't go right in and, and, and go into detail on those things or what clothes to wear and, 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 and so forth. But he spoke of prayer a lot. And actually, it, the disciples said to him, teach us to pray. Teach us how do we pray. Jesus said, this is it. Jesus actually went forward and, and, and made it a whole teaching lesson, a whole subject. A, a, this is a compulsory part of your curriculum as Christians. You know, this is foundational. You know, like going to school. Well, you know, you can do music if you want, but you don't have to do it. But everyone has to do mathematics because it's foundational to learning. Jesus says, there are some things, you know, you're going to have disputes about and liberty about this, that, and the other, what you do on the Sabbath, you know, when is the Sabbath, all this. You're going to have these disputes about that. But I tell you, here's something foundational that I'm teaching you that is for all Christians. And if you don't do this, then you're finished. That's it. There is, there is no supply of the Spirit. There is no action if this stops. It says prayer. I teach you how to pray. It's our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now that's the, come out of the Anglican prayer book version, modernized, but, but we know from both Matthew and Luke the, this importance of prayer. In John 17, we have this high priestly prayer of Jesus where we have this whole flow of Jesus praying. 
sanctify them in the truth. Jesus realized without prayer, him going to the cross is not going to save God's people if the high priestly prayer, if he as high priest of the order of Melchizedek is not going to cover this work in prayer. And it's the same for us as a church. If we're going to do the work, if we're going to go out there and give people tracts and, and talk to them and have church services and have Bible studies, it, it's, it's all a waste of time if it's not going to be covered in prayer. That's why it says that you must, you must pray. And Colossians 4, is this the, the only one incidental? No, Jesus has established that. So Paul is only working on what Jesus said. And Paul hasn't just said it in that one verse either. In, in all his letters, he's saying that. As well as the others' uh, letters uh, giving this emphasis. It's a means of communion. It was called spiritual disciplines, but that sounds like works righteous. So I'm not saying prayer is what gives us salvation. Uh, it's not a, you know, it's a means of grace, yes, but the, the, the communicating grace. It's not a saving, saving grace. You pray, you save yourself through your prayers. No, God saves us by his grace and therefore we must pray. It is the necessary response. Colossians 4, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. There it is. At the same time, you are being watchful in prayer and continuing steadfastly in prayer, as Jesus has called all his disciples. Pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word. See the importance of getting the word out there to people. To declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Because everybody needs to talk differently. I talk to some people that have had a background in a Catholic school or so, and they, so they're a bit sort of on the fence about this. They say, oh, yeah, I believe this, but not this, and they've got sort of ideas. And, or staunch atheists and talking about evolution creation. So, so how do we make it clear? How, how do we find the truth of Christ in, in what they are saying? And some people in psychology saying, oh, you know, that person's an alcoholic only because, you know, there was a death in the family or something. And th this is what I hear all the time. Or, you know, they, you know, they, they grew up without a father, so, so they're like this and that. So what all this is saying is people have excuses in the whole psychology world. is that People have excuses for why they are who they are, and you just got to let them be who they are. And so it's very hard to speak in that situation, say, no, we're with, without excuse. We are sinners. And we need to repent before God. We need to have remorse, genuine, sincere remorse for our sins and say, it's, it's my fault. I am evil, born in sin. And you, Lord, require truth within me and I haven't done that and I am responsible. And that's a hard thing to get across to a world that psychologically says um, in its humanism, uh, we are all basically good. And we just need to find ourselves. And going along with that is a trust in humanity. We just need people to bring out their best. And as we all do our best, we're going to get through this together. People are not trusting in God or seeing their, their desperate need for the grace of God day by day. And so people aren't praying. And it even flows through to the growth of the church. And Christians in a church are thinking, well, we want to build our church. But are we praying? And that is uh, the, the situation uh, here that, that is being asked. Uh, back in Ephesians 6, we're reminded we're, we're warfare against the devil, against spiritual forces of darkness. And only when we realize that, only when we realize the unseen world is there and we can realize that Things are going wrong because of the unseen world. We realize we've got to enter into the battle of that unseen world. And part of our weaponry, a major part, is prayer. So prayer is given the final, the, the, the final emphasis when it says there in Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. 
To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So there again, it is the call to pray for those. So the best thing is, Saturday night, and that's what I do with my wife, we have one hour, we pray, and we just take it easy. No, nothing that's going to mess your mind up. Don't get in, involved in some controversy in Facebook or, or, or some very sad movie that's going to just leave you dazed and confused the next morning on Sunday and the preaching's there. And a, No, Saturday night, prepare yourself. Just take it quietly. Say, I'm going to bed early and have a prayer time and be praying for the, the preaching of the word to go out on on, on that Sunday morning, the day of Christ's resurrection, that, that the glory of the truth of Christ may be seen and heard in the churches, and people may be converted. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. I'm only talking about one night before uh, before the um, Sunday morning services and Sunday evening services and all, all the things going on. But, but yes... It is there. It is there as our means of communicating with God. And that's the revival we need. I, I am amazed how I visit the churches and, and a part of their week it is, it might be this and that and the other. And, and they're all good. It's good to have things. But a specific prayer time is generally fallen away, generally not there. And I, I do understand we have Bible study groups and they're praying. And within families, and there's there's prayer is happening, and so we can't judge just on, on, on what the program says on the front page of, of the church and what we do and what the website or the Facebook page says. Nevertheless, I am of the opinion to what I've seen and to what I've read in the past that that we have become deficient in this area in Australian churches. And we have to think about that. At my church, we began a Friday morning, one hour prayer, and 15 minutes prayer meeting before the Sunday morning meeting. And there's a ladies prayer breakfast once a month on the Saturday morning. It's wonderful these things are set up and the Bible study groups have prayer time. Let's think about that importance in what we are doing when we're not the Moravians yet they had 24 7 they had rostered for everyone to pray around the clock people would say this is my hour in the week so they people knew in the church that at all times someone in the church was praying except for probably the um the sleeping hours of course but in the daylight hours from the rising of the sun till it's going down was covered in prayer I visited Korean churches in Seoul where I was staying at one and um, honorary Presbyterian church, and early in the morning I'd get up and from the dorm and, and go down and, and join the prayer meeting. And we'd go for hours every morning except Sunday morning. There would be uh, this opportunity, and, and and many people were there, and they would come before they went to work. They they committed this time to prayer. Now I don't want to become a ritual or say it's got to be this way or the other. But you would be hard-pressed as a Christian to, to be reading these verses and, uh, and, and then saying prayer doesn't matter. <laughs> that, or, or saying something like God has placed his son Jesus Christ to be the one who prays for us. And he's the one who prays 24-7, intercedes for us uh, on the throne and his prayers will achieve it all. We're, it doesn't matter whether we pray or not. That, that, that way of thinking is in conflict to what, what we've just read. And so when Jesus himself has called us to pray, and when his apostles, the apostles of Christ, who he has personally commissioned to write these letters to the churches, so we, we behave according to what Christ, our Lord, the head of the church, has said. But when Christ himself has called for such an importance on prayer and made it clear in Scripture, we are wrong when we come up with other paradigms that that would just shuffle prayer to the bottom shelf. Oh, we'll just we'll just we'll just file it 
file it in the background. We can't do that. For our church to come alive, we, we need to come alive in prayer again. Amen.